Gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Agency Exposed. How's Man, everybody? After last episode, I'm feeling so good. Yeah, you're in, you're healthy. I'm working out. Loop, I, I was going to say I'm looped up. I mean, my joints are looped up. <laughs> <laughs> Brad's Brad's lost at least ten pounds. Really? Or you're just wearing black? I'm not sure. Uh, I don't. That's what black does to you. <laughs> I, I'm like Johnny Cash. I wear black for the uh, for the lonely and the downtrodden. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Well, well, we've got a special, special guest today. We have, a, we have somebody a, special. A fourth this. person at the table. So, Brad, I'm going to let you introduce oh, yeah. our guest today. We have someone special here in the studio today. Um, he's a personal friend, and he uh, he's also a, the, one of the smartest, smartest man I know. Um, and he's uh, he's actually our CPA. And so today we're going to talk to uh, Chris Picaro. Um, he is, uh, man, he's awesome. And uh, I've worked with them now for maybe over five years. I can't remember. We'll we'll talk about it that a little bit more. He'll give you some insight. But a uh, little bio: Chris has been a, a CPA for more than uh, twenty years, and has spent the last sixteen years as founder and executive officer of Integrated CPA Group, out of uh, multiple states. Actually, um, him and his team are incredible. Um, they're uh they really take a different approach i think um at least personally for me than other cpas i worked with but uh without further ado i want to welcome chris 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 all right welcome well, to the you. studio thank you i got two specials as a guest so that's it i'm, I'm already <laughs> feeling good i'm wearing black also because it's it's friday and uh <laughs> black friday <laughs> black friday black friday not and uh we're in our pre-gym gear today so we're excited awesome <laughs> yes awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today. Today, I'd like to unpack a lot of stuff if we can, and we're probably going to go a little bit off the rails, but that's okay. Um, man, Chris, uh, you and I have something in common, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, and we are both both from Detroit originally. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, when I heard your accent, I realized that you're not only from Detroit, you're probably from someplace in the east side of Detroit. Oh yeah, we've got that, that we've got that East of Woodward accent going here. Yeah. So if any, any of their Detroiter friends know that. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> like, I haven't lived in Detroit for like fifteen years, but now I can hear the accents and I can tell exactly like what borough of Detroit you're what from. You? It's it's a weird trait, but I never knew I had an accent when I lived in Michigan. I thought everybody else had accents. I yeah, sound right. I sound just like the guy in the Same. news. Same. Me too. I changed my I need to get an accent. Yeah, you kind of you guys have like you've got the everyman accent. Yeah, I guess. So. Yeah, <laughs> lived all over. <laughs> so, Chris, it's 2021. With 2021, we have a new administration. There's a lot of changes that are probably going to happen uh, for businesses when it comes to their finance, when it comes to things they want to do, and uh, different uh, tax laws and and other miscellaneous uh, conundrums. So, I. Uh, <laughs> I want you to, to, to tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in the horizon starting off in 2021, maybe uh, anything else that you feel strong about today. All right. Well, there is a, there's an ocean of information out there. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, a lot of times people talk about, hey, we've got, what are my 25 tax tips or 10 things for this year, list, list radio, which I'm sure you guys don't want to be a part of. Mm -hmm. So what we've tried to do in our practice is take all of this and, and drive down into three main principles. So I'm going to first start with those three main principles, and then everything that we talk about is going to build off of those. Understanding that everyone's tax situation is unique, um, but the, the three main principles, are, the first one we all have to remember is one, the government is your business partner. Hmm. Okay. Think about that. Mm -hmm. They're an involuntary business I think I partner. want to get out of business. Is, is that good? <laughs> Well, here's the great part, Brad. The government is your business partner, but here's the nice thing. You get to write the operating agreement. What All does right. that mean? You decide how you're going to organize your business. You decide how you're going to manage your affairs. You decide what decisions you're going to make and what, what those decisions mean from a tax perspective. So even though it's an involuntary partnership, they're going to, you get to write the operating agreement. Now, are they a silent partner? Um, you hope they're a silent partner. <laughs> they can stick their head out and request a meeting via an audit. Um, they could be a very expensive partner. They could be a very good partner, and they can and and they can't be ignored. You know, if you ignore them, if you don't live up to the operating agreement, meaning don't take care of your compliance 
the compliance part of being a business owner, then they become a very bad business partner. Mm. Mm. It's yeah. a good analogy. It is yeah. a good analogy. I never thought about it like that. You know, uh, part of what I, I want to do today is... I thought they were is, the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> they can be. <laughs> the, uh, one of the things I want to do today is kind of break things down in real simple um, concepts, especially for people that may be starting new businesses this year that are listening to this podcast, um, you know, from the ground up. And really, you know, most of the people that we know of that start businesses they don't come from a financial background a lot of times they just um they get into the business because they love the craft of what they do they're practitioners of their of their craft and and um but sometimes they have a they they're challenged in the area of what to do how to position their business even how to set up a company um what type of you know uh, corporation is set up that's best for them and um and i mean let's face it when i look at taxes there's one objective I, I have with my partner, right? Mm-hmm. Give them as little. <laughs> correct. How do I pay them as little as possible that is legal and fair? And, mm-hmm. and you know, so those are some of the things. That's that's the mindset. That's all I have. I don't have anything else. I don't, I'm don't. i not very strategic when it comes to other things. So that's when you come in and you help me and my company position ourselves um, so that we can do that but in a in a legal fair way and um any and it's very helpful it's been really helpful for our company so well that and first of all i don't know if i thanked you guys for having me and what an honor this is that i get to drive three and a half miles and do this yeah we make you we made you bring your own coffee (laughs) that's all right yeah we make you bring your own coffee (laughs) so um so as far as the first of the big what we call the big three the, the government is your business partner you get to write the operating agreement. Here's a good thing. You get to pick your board of directors. You pick your CPA. You pick your attorney. You pick your insurance uh, professional. So that's the good part. On to what you were saying. It's funny. Our, our calling card or our, what we do is we legally and ethically reduce the taxes entrepreneurs and real estate investors pay in their lifetime. Not today, in their lifetime. And that's our calling card. Mm. Now, the secret sauce is how we do it. So um, which leads me to number two, your, your facts equal your tax. Okay. And you make your facts. If you want to change your tax situation, you have to change your fact pattern. Hmm. So how do you do that? You can do things on your own or you use your board of directors and there's not much we can fix right now for 2020. There are some things you can do after the end of the year to do tax planning, uh, tax planning and strategy is way more important than tax return preparation. Internally, we always talk about, you know, we're, Brad, we were talking before the show, like when you're running or exercising, all these things come in your head. And I, the one phrase that came to my head about a couple of weeks ago, just as recently, even though I've been doing this for like 20 years, is um, tax return should be a verb, not a noun. It should be something that's happening all year round, not something that gets done at the end of the year. Because mm-hmm. if it's something that gets done at the end of the year, the government is a crappy business partner for you. Right. Mm. That's mm-hmm. good. That's, that's a good tip. Do you, fi- do you find that that's the case? Like, I, I can't imagine your business because I, what I see in my mind is these business people who are so busy running their business, they're not taking care of their paperwork and they just hand you a bunch of paper that's thick <laughs> and say, find that stuff in there, it's in there, and then make some magic for me and do it and here it is on april 14th well right exactly so that's a challenge in our industry and a lot of the our, uh, practitioners in, in, in our industry struggle with that but you have to set an expectation with your clients you are we are business partners you know and we are partners in in doing this together just like i'm sure in marketing people like myself wonder well how in the world am i going to be able to target my exact i specialize in real estate investors and entrepreneurs how am I going to target this needle in a haystack where for you guys, you might say, that's easy. This is how you do it. Mm. So we have to have a process. And in our practice, we say that it's only a problem until there's a process. So if multiple clients are having the same issue, giving us information, then we know something's wrong in our, in our practice. One of the things that uh, you say a lot, I know, is uh, the uh, process runs your business and people run the process, mm-hmm. right? And I've used that before, and I think I maybe even coined it from you. So sorry if I stole it. 
but um, I've noticed that a lot, and I it's really as a client, it's really easy because you have so many very easy processes. You use a lot of digital tech to manage a lot of the paperwork. I like I have my own portal with you. I can see all my history. I have all my documents up there, um, and you it makes it for easier for you guys too. And it's there's a lot of transparency that way. Um, so well, thank you. Yeah, we we try to uh, you know I've I've made some mistakes. I paid a lot of well, I say a lot of tuition in the last twenty years, eighteen years as a practitioner on my own. As far as growing a business based on me running it and not processes running it, so that's that's the key. And I stole it from someone else. I can't remember who the heck I stole it from. <laughs> Are there any like so so I love these little these phrases because they break down this scary complicated thing that I, I would think for any business owner i mean i know some really sophisticated ones that they've kind of you know because they've had to kind of get it get a hang on it but they really don't like no one really has a hang on it you always let you're always wondering if if you're doing it the right way or if there's a better way or you know if i'm gonna get that scary letter or something like that because there's just so much unknown it's so complicated um so these simple things are super, super valuable. I wonder when you say like, you know, I love the the tax return process is a verb and that sounds really annoying, but I, but that sounds like, the, but that's a benefit, right? Like mm-hmm. thinking, it's like looking ahead versus looking in the rear view, right? Running your business, being intentional. What are some things, if you break that down, that, um, because ultimately I would say, okay, so agency owners and most business owners, they're not, financial experts that's why they they're experts at what they do right um and so you know they're not thinking about this stuff all the time they may not, may not even be doing things the right way um from a structural standpoint what are some things that can be done throughout the year obviously getting a great advisor is one of those things but even yourself like what are some things that they can we can do throughout the year that are simple but help to kind of plan for paying as little as you can legally and right. actually, I don't know, you can get into like, hey, I know these are not, this is not tax advice, by the way. This is not investment advice, by the way. <laughs> We're just talking. Um, but I'd be curious to know if Ken wants are, to know the hacks. Yeah, I want to know like, <laughs> sure. you know, Let's, you know, if you got extra cash, where do you put that? Like, how do you separate right. the thing? How do you protect things? Like all that kind of stuff. So, no, that's a great question. I'm going to hit on our third topic and then I'm going to dive okay, into the, it, how it, we do this understand the difference between everyone knows what cash flow is we've started using a term called tax flow the Mm. difference between cash flow and tax flow two completely different concepts that could be unrelated meaning cash flow is easy cash goes out cash comes in tax flow is a tax deduction or taxable income so not all so understanding kind of like you're saying hey should i put twenty ten thousand dollars into a sep ira okay that's great that's ten thousand dollar deduction Maybe that saves you twenty five hundred dollars. I'm sorry, defers you twenty five hundred dollars right. in tax. That's still a minus seventy five hundred dollar cash flow. So for agency owners that are growing, usually in that growth mode, you are um, cash is t- is tight, right? And and whenever mm-hmm. you're in that growth mode, you're usually hiring people before you, it could be an employee or it could be a contractor. Yeah. It could be some. You could be hiring help before you really have the the full capacity that that. To, to use that help. Or the other problem is you've grown so much that you need help quickly, but you can't step away from your business to train those people. So you end up just doing it all on your own and being really disorganized. So mm-hmm. how do we so how do we help people like that? Well, first understanding the environment that we're in right now, even though we just had an, another big tax law passage, I'm sure we're going to talk about, we are under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. Through 2025, we are probably in the lowest tax rate environment you're ever going to see in our lifetime. I would be shocked if the taxes ever went down from here. Mm. For business owners, there are a lot of great opportunities for them. Um, The qualified business income deduction in section 199A deduction was a gift um, from your business partner to give you up to a 20% deduction based on your business income. But here's the problem. I'm doing what a lot of prospective clients do and even some of our clients do. We have to, I'm I'm prescribing without diagnosing. Mm. So diagnose, prescribe. You, that's that's how we do it and i would assume other people do it um so what how to help someone first diagnose your situation we happen to use color coding diagnosis red green purple gold but you can use whatever um so if you're a, a new business agency owner and you're starting to accumulate cash 
the first thing you need to do before you can implement any tax strategy is figure out where you're at and project your tax return. So if it's June 15th and you want to know where you're at, do a mock year end on May 31st. What if May 31st was December 31st? Are you happy with where you're at? If you're not happy, what are my options? So you, we would diagnose, and I can only talk about our practice, if you have a if you're in a huge marginal tax bracket, you're a red diagnosis. Okay, what should we do? And then move forward. So mm. we've been taught a lot of a, you know, generations, maybe a bad practice. Baby boomers and, and all those yeah. like pay off your house, put right. money in your IRA. And those are healthy things to do. But um, those are that's the difference between cash flow and tax flow. I, I, you know, you see a lot of couple of senior citizens that have a significant amount in their IRA, they have their house paid off. And they're struggling month to month mm. to make it on a small pension and social security. So now every time they draw money out of their retirement account, that makes their social security, um, the portion of social security taxable at a higher rate, right? right? They can't rip a shingle off when they have a medical issue. Right. They, so that, that, that's part of the, back to the agency yeah. owner is, I wanna set something up for my retirement, okay. Does it make sense to do, look, let's look at how many employees you have. Are you, are you a solo owner? How much can you earmark? Again, diagnose, prescribe. I, should I do a SEP? Should I do a symbol? Should I do a solo case? Should I do a Roth? I don't know yet. What is your objective? How much are you earmarking towards retirement right now? But how much money do you have to reinvest in your business also? I love connecting it to cash flow because we talk a lot. And I think, in my opinion, um, agencies are, are one of the most vulnerable to challenges and cash flow um maybe any service business but uh, a mentor of mine a long time ago had said that you know cash flow is going to be what kills your business you know the you know it's not because you may you know people invoice and they're like oh great we're making money and they and you know the uh, receivables get out of date out of date out of date and all of a sudden you've got this big gap and you're hiring people and there's fluctuations and then it's it's a real challenge and we see that happening all the time so I like connecting it to cash flow because you're that's interesting and 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 um you know I was saying I was last year I was going into okay what what additional things or what are, what are there there are some things for retirement that I think that my friends like Brad and Bob are doing that I'm not doing and oh I better do that um I feel still, like that's the still wrong young. I feel still like young. that's the wrong mindset though <laughs> because that's like the one size fits all kind of thing. I think we get into that kind of thing because at the end of the day I would I would bet for most entrepreneurs and for most business owners um, they want to you know I get want part of their biggest retirement is their business, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you also because because your position might fluctuate over time to me I value access to cash. Like so I don't want to I, I have this thing inside me when I put it in something that's locked until I'm 65 or whatever, that's scary to me. I'm like, I want, I, I want to be able to put it away, but I want to be able to access it. You know, if I decide, Hey, I need to not take a salary for a year or something like that because we're doing, you know, I don't know. So are, are yeah, those crazy yeah, things? No, absolutely. So to me as a business owner, cash is, is King cash flow is yeah. King. And, and I would say to, Back to the original question, what, what would you say to an agency owner just starting out? Do something small, create a business savings account and just say to yourself, I'm gonna take 10% of every dollar that comes in and I'm putting it in the savings account. And you know that's my access to emergency cash. And at the end of the year or throughout the year, I can either put that into a, an investment that's gonna make me money, or I might be able to, um, it doesn't have to be a retirement asset. It could be a real estate investment. It could be anything mm -hmm. or, so that that would that's where I would start. But I think access to cash is huge. And that's where I could say, without getting into too many details, both Brad and I are, are using some advanced strategies that we are um, building some after tax cash up that we, we both like real estate and invest in like investing in real estate. So that strategy works great. It doesn't give us the best tax deduction immediately, but we're not worried about a ta tax deduction today. It you have to make a lot of money mm, to get yeah. into the twenty out of the 24% marginal tax bracket. You have to be over $400,000 of adjusted gross income to be really hammered on taxes, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of room on that uh, on that tarmac. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm. What's the biggest mistake 
that you see um, small business owners making right out? I know that's a that's a big topic, but mm-hmm. like, what's the biggest mistake that you see? Because we talk to a lot of solopreneurs, small agencies, even medium sized to large. But for the most part, I would I would think most of our listeners are on the small business side. Mm-hmm. What's the biggest mistake they make? Taking tax advice from their peers and not their CPA. From a podcast. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I, they're probably making bigger mistakes than that, but that's just you know, right, because yeah. sometimes you have new business owners that are kind of aloof to even entity structuring and how they should structure their business. And then sometimes on the other end, you have people that got sucked into paying $15,000 to an attorney to create this ex- elaborate. Um, yeah chart of a business or you know business entity structure and they don't have any sales so i Hmm. think that uh, the biggest mistake is going would be just not in all in all seriousness not creating your um not creating your team Mm. you know or or your what we we board advisors board of advisors thank you not not creating that because they're kind of what brad said in the beginning they're great at their craft you know, you you when you when you run into an entrepreneur, you've got a couple. You've got people that are like really good at being an entrepreneur, but eh, okay at doing their craft. Or you have people that are like savant people, but they can't tie their shoes when it comes to doing a right uh, running a business. So mm-hmm. I I think identifying your your weaknesses and playing your strengths. My shoes are untied right now. Just, just don't don't look, but they probably are. <laughs> don't look. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, for me, even though I say processes run my, the business, that's not my passion. So luckily I have an awesome partner that he basically handles everything in the kitchen. I'm handling everything outside the kitchen and it just works for us. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't have to be an equity business partner. It could be, it could be an, a, a key team member. It could be someone that's um, outsourced, you know? So, yeah. Hmm. Have, you've worked with um, all kinds of different businesses. Do you work with a lot of marketing agencies and things like that? Yeah, we have. Uh, so pretty much our entire practice is going to be our entrepreneurs and real estate investors. Mm. So yes, we have we have several uh, agencies, marketing and other agencies, also insurance agencies, a lot of real estate agencies. Mm. Do you find that... Um, Agencies, you know, that's a big term. We we deal in a niche of, of marketing and digital, but in at the end of the day, an agency is somebody who provides a service, right? So in the service business, do you find and I'd love to know just kind of your experience and, and your practice, what unique challenges do we who offer services versus um, other kinds of business mm-hmm. who offer products or, you know, widgets or mm-hmm. food? industry mm-hmm. things like that what 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 do you find right well that one that you gave me a good, easy question that's a great thank you <laughs> um the biggest challenge we all because we're all in a service business right mm-hmm. tax returns are a commodity yeah. you can go on TurboTax and do right. it you can go to h&r block y- your competitor does it for free right exactly <laughs> yeah, yeah. and that's True. fine and and you know what i would tell you i send for all the leads that come into our practice, I would tell you more than half of them, I'm going to tell them that I'm not the best fit. That they sometimes just go do it on TurboTax Live. Um, yeah. So what sh- when you're su- providing an, uh, a service that is a commodity that you could look at the insurance business that you can go on a, a website. Mm-hmm. And, and a, but the problem is for a lot of people, that could be a good solution. But what's, what's happening is when you look at what you're getting, it's not apples to apples. So when you can add value as far as strategy, consulting, and planning, that's why we, our whole business is, is membership-based subscription model, believe it or not. We don't mm. even have timesheets in our practice. And if, if I can't add a lot of value with, and when I say I, my awesome team, will we'll mm. never listen to this probably, but that's all right. <laughs> um, but no, um, if we can't add strategy, consulting, and advising, then I'm not adding enough mm. value. So in an agency situation, if I would say what the ch- you know what are you get what's special about what you're doing you know and that's why the customer is coming back and we and in our practice we say let your let your best client pick your pick your next client and mm. and that those referrals are what's going to be like it's good you know kind of thinking for your for your clients what would i do without this person or this firm i don't know I'm, i'd be lost yeah. um so it might be something like we make sure you're not lost because it can get, you know, it, yeah. you almost have so much if you just, and I look at the tax business where, like I said, it, 
tax return back to, you know, if it's a noun, then we're not going to be a good fit for you. Um, mm. Are there any, um, like, sp- are, are there any kind of like things that you do different for businesses that are primarily service versus, um, you know, businesses that sell a product? Mm-hmm. Right, because the cost structure is different, that kind of thing, like human resources, that kind of thing. Like, are there optimizations that you would typically look at? I know it is not one size. Such, so um, I'm not sure I understand. I'm like sorry. The, like just, his pricing points? No, no, no. I mean, just well, yeah, no, just to like to optimize your tax strategy and your and you know the the keeping more than giving right in tax. Like, what uh, so, you know, services services are slightly different. I know there's, I mean, sales tax is different. All that kind of stuff is different. Oh, right. So I would say, first of all, businesses with inventory automatically have huge cash flow challenges, even if that, you know, if, even if it's not physical inventory, right. it could be, um, you know, advertising space or whatever your inventory is, you're going to have cash flow challenges because you have to buy that inventory before you can sell it in general. So they're going to, those companies, I think, access to capital, working a lot with um, their banker and making sure that they can run their business is, is, is very important. For service-based businesses, the rules are a little different, uh, especially with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 and uh, some of the rules with, not to get too technical, but there's something called specialized service trader business rules, so they, they might get phased out of one of the a key deduction. Mm. Um, but I would say the, I don't know, the biggest difference I would say with the, the very successful service-based businesses or their processes are, are spot on. The very successful uh, in, inventory-based businesses have a lot of research and development and, and product development costs. And so those are like the, the biggest deductions typically on, on that side? They could be deductions so, or they could be actually a tax credit that you can mm, receive right. for research and development. Now, I'd love to talk a little bit about that R&D credit because um, I know it exists, from what I understand, it exists to some extent in the service industry. Um, but how do, how do service businesses, agencies optimize that kind of thing? Well, if possible. <laughs> so I'm going to speak from the CPA side, and then I might ask Brad to speak on it for a minute. Um, yeah, and Brad, you that, can chime in because I know you were in, you were deep in this for, for a year and a half, right? We uh, yeah, we are. I've, uh, our our agency is taking advantage of some of the, the R and D credit. Right. So with, with our with the R and D credit, we always think about that for big businesses and in someone that's creating a new product, but it really could be some thing that you're altering or a process that's unique for your industry. So if by talking to clients throughout the year and getting to know their business on our end, if I feel like there might be an opportunity to say this person's researching and developing something that's different from their industry, that's improving on something. At that point, I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to bring in a strategic partner of ours to say, can you talk to this person and see if there's something there for them? Mm-hmm. And understanding that a tax credit is better than a deduction. A tax credit is m- money in your pocket. Mm-hmm. And then the, then the, the, that firm will come in. And, and similar, like in my, my practice, I'd say our biggest mistake as CPA is thinking that we have to do everything for everybody. No, we have to be your CFO. We have to, and some things we can do internally, implementation-wise, a, a lot of things we have to bring in other resources. What we have is we're, we're someone's number one trusted financial advisor. We're someone's number two, um, other than your, your primary care physician, professional, trusted professional. Mm. Uh, so that's a lot of responsibility. So I'm not going to make anyone my guinea pig. So we'll bring in a firm and they'll look at it and, and figure out if it makes sense to, to take the credit. The cool thing about the R&D credit is you can, once you have it set up, you can take it every year mm. moving forward. Mm. So... I would say if you're doing something as an agency that's a little different, even if it's digital or um, it doesn't have to be a, a, a physical product, yeah. um, talk to your CPA and see if, if there's something there for you. I, I will say that you can go back up to three years on your tax returns and mm. claim a credit from the last three years. And it can be pretty big. It can right? be pretty big. Yeah. And usually the night, now I will say it takes a long time to get it right now. As mm. of October, the IRS had over 5 million pieces of mail that were unopened. We're still waiting I'm almost. St- yeah, I'm still waiting. Maybe on almost it. a year for mm. for one of our years back mm-hmm. um, audit. I haven't even, they haven't even looked at my tax return yet. <laughs> no, I as far as I know. <laughs> but I mean, so for our firm, we've been able to take a portion of what we do have been deemed 
uh, through this other firm that you recommended has deemed that we um, can be uh, used for R&D credit. <clears throat> and so we do a lot of development from the ground up where we actually help clients even um, uh, launch products, actually even build products. We, we actually help the design process um, of new brand new products and new innovation. And so um, it's been really cool. I, it does take a little bit of time and paperwork. You've really got to go back years and pull statement of works and prove that, you know, what you do is would be considered R and D. Uh, but once you do instead, you know, instill that into your business, then like you said, moving forward, then it becomes a lot easier and um, you can take, hopefully take advantage of that until, the law changes, huh? Exactly. I think that, <laughs> so that's a, it's that first time that's really painful. Although it, I mean, you can pick up three years of R and D credit and then moving forward, it's a kind of a maintenance thing. I would say one caveat is, is your labor costs have to be here in the United States. It right. could be a subcontractor. It could be W two wages. And another thing is that you like, if you have contractors, you can also that are in the United States, you can, um, you can uh, take advantage of their costs as well, but they have to work with you on an hourly basis only. Mm -hmm. So if they send you a statement of work and this is the cost for this amount of work that doesn't apparently apply, they have to just bill you on an hourly the cool, rate. The cool thing about that, and I feel like um, most people I talk to you aren't really aware of it, or they, they assume it's, you know, for physical product, you know, um, I think the cool thing about that is it allows you like a company like ours to without bothering with like, oh man, is this going to be a, a huge risk to try out and create this new thing to innovate? It allows you to innovate with it. And that's what, that's what the government wants, obviously. Mm -hmm. But like, that's a huge freedom when you can start to invest into innovating and creating products. And mm -hmm. for, in our world, it's mainly digital products or those advertising products and those kind of things. Right. But create those products without the huge risk of, of you know, this the times yeah. getting away from you. And just back to the, the government's your business partner. What is the government telling us by offering an R&D credit? Re develop product, develop things, but also use labor in the United States. Right. And that's so every all of these tax changes are really the government giving us a, a way to do things that that they want. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean that's bad. It's just, you have to read through the tea leaves, just like, you know, P PPP that came out. Now with the new, uh, the CAA Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, I even had to look down to see what the, we just call mm -hmm. it CAA. The employee retention credit is something new if you're not going to qualify for PPP for 2021. Why? Because the government wants us to continue to employ people. They want us to, you know, especially people here in this country at this point. Right. So those are some of the, so you have to, you have to really look through the what, reason the, behind the reason. It. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll give you an example with the CAA, something very small that came out with, because there, this is a 5,500 page act business meals now in 2021 and 2022 are 100% deductible. They're only 50% deductible. Bingo. So now cash flow versus tax. <laughs> you want to go to lunch today? <laughs> yeah, I'll take you out to Starbucks. Uh, <laughs> no. So t yeah, unfortunately, we're all eating at home. <laughs> I know. Tw so 2021, um, so cash flow versus tax flow, right? You still have to pay 20 bucks for a lunch, mm -hmm. but at least you get a deduction for it. Why? Because the government wants us to put, start going out and getting takeout or going out to eat and, you know, supporting right. local restaurants. Mm. Yeah, what is or doesn't have to be a local restaurant, but thank I, you. COVID. I always I, I start mm -hmm. to ask myself with with all these type of things, um, really, what is the behavior that they're trying to they're trying to create? Um, because if you can understand that, you can kind of like really do the right thing without having to as a as an owner at least like understand every letter of what what's going on. As long as you have someone that can advise you, I have a question. Um, it's twenty twenty one. What do you anticipate? And I'm not holding you to it. I know it's an, maybe might be an uncomfortable uh, question, but what do you anticipate changing under a new administration? Mm -hmm. well, Good, bad, whatever. Right. Well, we did, it's funny. We did a couple events in October about the the effect of the ta the election on your tax return, and um, I thought of, so. A couple things uh, with uh, President Biden, President elect Biden. I guess he got sworn in so a couple of days ago. So. What, with what he's what his tax plan was doesn't necessarily mean that's what's going to get passed. Right. 
I, my own personal opinion, I think things are going to stay the same here in 2021. I don't know that something's going to get passed and then go retroactively back. Typically, it's okay if we're going to repeal the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2020 or uh, 2017. Sorry, all these years. Then, um, then it might get repealed in 2022. In 20, and, and so instead of it going through 2025, we lose three years of it. Um, what he was proposing. On, on the corporate tax side was a, an increase of corporate taxes by 33%, going from 21% flat tax up to 28% flat tax. So what does that mean? The bigger companies, I mean, that's a significant amount of tax for C corporations. Um, there were some, despite in the real estate world, um, potentially losing the bonus depreciation on, on uh, at five, seven and 15 year assets. So Big picture wise, if you're buying real estate, you're not gonna be able to deduct or depreciate it as fast as before. You might not be able to take your passive losses as quickly as before. You might not be able to engage in a 1031 exchange like you did before. Those are some bigger picture things. Um, there are some things that that were proposed that would be in generally helpful as far as with tuition credits. Um, but I would say the theme would be Income, we'll say 100-ish and lower, we'll probably see some great benefits. 100 to 250, see some some negative results. And then 250 and above, it would be a negative result. Mm. Okay. I can't say it's good or bad. I mean- Sounds bad. <laughs> if it's a business owner, it's, just it's, it's bad. You know, yeah, I mean, if, if, as a purely, so if we're talking from just a fiscal um uh, point of view it is bad for business owners so mm. we're gonna have to plan around that and um yeah. now will this all get passed that's you know you've got the national association of realtors one of the most powerful organizations out there do you think they're going to be very happy about losing yeah. almost a lot of the that's worst case scenario but mm -hmm. the, on the positive side if you've got kids in college if you have student mm -hmm. loans if you have i mean there's a lot of other benefits as well that exactly. may or may not impact you exactly exactly that's where it's going to come a lot of those comes down like the college stuff comes down to income so mm -hmm. just to give an example let's say you have a let's talk about diagnose prescribe okay let's say i have a business owner that makes two hundred thousand dollars a year and they have a child in college tax laws change and they say you know what we're going to give you a huge credit for college as long as your income's under a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, that's that that seems reasonable. In that fact pattern, I would say, well, your income's two hundred. Maybe you should form a corporation. Maybe you should just keep thirty grand in in the corp, pay the corporate tax. That's now before Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Actually, the first twenty or first fifty thousand dollars of corporate income was taxed at fifteen percent. So keep some money in your corp. Give yourself a W two for. 130,000 put you know 20,000 into your 401k 10,000 into you know uh, something pre-tax so now we have this w2 for a hundred thousand dollars and you're going to qualify on the personal tax side so what does that mean uh prescribed diagnose that might mean we're going to restructure your business i'm not i'm not saying right. specific i'm not giving out any specific advice but i'm just that's how there we're going to have to do think. it yeah. yeah exactly you just have to have the right team in place now, for new business owners or people who are going to start businesses this year, can you talk just briefly about the differences of the type of um, corporations and what they, what the positive and negatives are of those? Just quickly, like a C corp to an S corp to an LLC to a DBA or whatever else you want to do. Could you quickly just breeze through those in about two minutes and kind of give us an overview of the positives? Yes, what okay. they're for. In two minutes. I okay. I'll give it a try. <laughs> well, I think that's always interesting no, I'm, because I'm, I, I'm like, on. if I was to start a business today, you know, people might not know what the benefit is, and you don't want to start a business under a certain allocation that you're like, man, I've got this type of company, and I really would have benefited if I would have it would have been an LLC or whatever. Right. Okay. So I'm going to start with sole proprietor. That just means you you're in business. If you drive an Uber, you're sole proprietor. You don't. You know, anyone that does anything for themselves is, is a sole proprietor. If you form an LLC, now LLC stands for limited liability company. Sometimes people think it's corporation. An LLC, if you're a single member LLC, meaning you're the only owner for federal tax purposes is a disregarded entity. That means that you're a sole proprietor. What it's giving you is potentially liability protection. You could, you could be a corporation. A corporation we starts off by being a C corporation meaning that you are an entity separate 
um, tax wise from your personal being. And then if you're a corporation, you could elect to be an S corporation. That's a, it stands for small business corporation or subchapter S corporation, which is a hybrid between an LLC and a corporation. Understand that if you're a C corporation, you're separately taxed. The corporation itself pays a separate tax than you personally under the S corp or the LLC or the sole proprietor. What Those are all what we call transparent entities and the profit and loss from those businesses flows on your personal tax return. My advice, my two minute advice to someone, if they're just starting, would be potentially just form an LLC because within the first 75 days of forming that LLC, you can actually elect to be taxed as an S or a C. So it gives you a little flexibility in the first 75 days. Mm. Now, in general, that election is gonna have to stick for five years. Um, so that that would be, that'd be my best advice, but we have to, Diagnose them prescribed, really. If you're a small business, why would you ever do a C-Corp? Would there be a reason? Yeah, the reason, well, right now with the C-Corp, uh, I mean, it's a flat 21% tax. So one, if you're ineligible to be an S-Corp, let's say you have a, a, over hundreds of shareholders or one of your shareholders is not a U.S. Uh, resident, or if you want to retain some income in the C-Corporation, then mm. those, those are reasons that you would want to be one. So the C corps are pretty rare for small business owners, and you also have to look at the state tax code too. S corps, for instance, in in other states are very advantageous. It's funny. I had a bookkeeper. We were working on a mutual client yesterday, and she said, "You know, I hate to challenge. Like, I hate to be nosy, but why is this person a, not an S corp?" Mm. And I'm like, "That is an awesome question." And I explained because he, you know, in the state of Tennessee, based on this person's fact pattern, it would cost him more money to be the S corp. And we actually recorded a two three minute video about that about six months ago and I sent it to her and she's like, okay, that makes sense. So you have to look at mm. the whole picture. What's the yearly fees for co different corporations like franchise free fees and mm -hmm. things? Well, it depends on each state. Yeah. I would say on average, the state to be any type of entities, probably if I had to say an average $250 a year to the state, you know, California's 800, of course, mm. you know, Michigan is actually really low. It's a $50 a month. Tennessee's $300 or $50 a year, $300 a year. That's just to, you have to pay the state to be an entity. Mm. Now, how you're taxed depends. So if you have a, you know, based on your in, it, it really comes down to facts and circumstances. Because if, if I have someone that's a really high income earner that uh, that is, you know, the being an S corp, well, okay, let me, let me walk it back real quick. The main advantage of being an S corporation is that your net income after you pay yourself a reasonable compensation, which we could talk about in a second, is not subject to what's called self-employment tax. That's, so for all the agency owners out there, the business owners, you probably have heard of this. Um, when you're an employee, you have 7.65% of your wages taken out to Social Security and Medicare. Their employer actually matches that. So when you're self-employed, you have to pay 15.3%, up to about, a, I think it's 142,500. I could, someone's gonna, uh, look it up and write you guys telling me to never have me on the show again. <laughs> it's probably about that. Um, it just it indexes for inflation every year. So the first $142,500 of your self-employment income is subject to the 15.3% tax. Well, if you're an S corp, if let's say your profit's 150,000, if you can justify a reasonable compensation of 50,000, then the remaining amount that $100,000 is not subject to self-employment tax. And if you do take that out of the business, they would just be a dividend. Now, not a dividend, like a qualified dividend we talk about from brokerage account, but it's mm -hmm. a distribution of profits. So in that fact pattern, that's a $15,000 tax savings by being an S Corp in that mm -hmm. fact pattern, but you have to factor in franchise tax. Right Now with Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the birth of the 199A deduction, qualified business income deduction, you get a 20% deduction based on your net income. So for an S corp, that's after you pay your wages. For a sole proprietor, that's you're not paying yourself wages. So the so you we have to run the numbers and see. Now I want to hear on one thing: reasonable compensation. You you can't be an S corp and take z and reasonable compensation is not zero. So what? How do we come up with reasonable compensation? Well, we use sophisticated software um, that gives us a range. Of, of compensation based on someone's experience that that we feel is IRS compliant. So in in, but again, state you know then you've got to factor in state taxes as well. But mm. so that's kind of how we how we figure out what the best entity structure is. 
That's interesting. Um, I've, I've sort of been through a lot of that arc just uh, over the years with different businesses and stuff. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious as you as you look at that, like, I don't know, back in the day, I don't know if you, you did this, Brad, but I know, Bobby, you were, you were like kind of more complicated corporate structures, even for like starting entrepreneurs and those kind of things seemed to be the way to go. And I could be wrong, but it seems like it's gone to more simplified uh, advice professionally um, in how in how you structure your businesses. But, you know, is that something that's advantageous, right? Let's say you have a business. So so you're, Brad, are you an S-Corp? Yes, we are an S-Corp. Okay, so Medicaid is an LLC, but it's a partnership. Um, and uh, and we've had, we started with, I have my own company, my partner has my own, his own company, and, and the, two, the two companies own shares. Does that make sense anymore? Or is it better to simplify stuff? No, I, I, that's a good structure because the base, it, there's no good or bad structure. It really comes down. Right. I know you're going to whack it's me over the head when you hear me benefit, say, right? Like, yeah, yeah. diagnose, yeah. prescribe. Mm. But um, it really comes down to what the cool thing about structuring is, is we have to figure out what the relationship looks like, what you're trying to accomplish, and then go from there. So I mm. like the LLC structure where you have two entities as members of that LLC. Um, you know, in Tennessee, we have a state of uh, franchise and excise tax. Mm that we have to tangle with. But in general, that's a, that's a small tax on a service business that doesn't have a lot of inventory that their income subject to self-employment tax. So, it, you know, because here's the situation, you could have a partnership. Let's say, Bob, you're in uh, Michigan. Eh, I don't know if you want to freeze. We'll throw Brad <laughs> back in, in Florida. Michigan. <laughs> you're in Florida and your business partners. Well, you could have an LLC that, Bob, you have an LLC that owns half of it. Mm -hmm. Brad, you have a LLC that owns half of it, but your LLC is taxes an S. Bob's LLC's tax is a sole proprietor. So does LLC's, we call it the boutique entity. It's like a piece of Play-Doh that you can really mold. Mm. Where S-Corps and C-Corps are more rigid. Mm. Okay. That's good. So it's good to have that because mainly the benefit is that the individuals can kind of flex based on their situation. Is that right? Yeah. And, and especially if you have a business partner and the LLC provides you with, with a lot of different options for revenue sharing, you can have an... an um, your ownership percentage and your revenue share could be different. With mm. an S-Corp, if we're 50-50, we have to take 50-50 dividends. Our wages could be different, but our dividends and our revenue share have to be 50-50. Yeah. You, know, you see it a lot in the real estate space where you have kind of a, a money person and an operator. And, mm. and so you could we could say, hey, we're 50-50 owners of the LLC. I'm sitting around um, you know, playing Fortnite all, night, all day, and you're out working. <laughs> So yeah. you get 90% of the profit. Yeah. I only That's get 10% of the profit. You see a problem with that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm working. <laughs> R&D, so baby. <laughs> it's R, yeah, exactly. So so you could have that. So it really comes down to um, making sure that you, you know, it's a fine line between racking up a bunch of attorney fees right. and getting talking to 10 and Ten compliance people. stuff too is it gets to be a headache, even mm -hmm. if it's not fees. Like just from if again, if you're doing it yourself and you don't have a team, you're mm -hmm. having to remember to do this and that, and just kind of stacks. It, I'll say one more thing because we say this all the time: don't let the tax tail wag the dog. Yeah, you guys are successful. Do your thing. We can figure out how to minimize good. your taxes legally and ethically. I have a question. Mm -hmm. What what is the? I know when I ran an agency, I was an LLC, single member. Um, I know that you mentioned at the very beginning of this discussion, you said um, a single member LLC is, tr is a pass through. So it's disregarded by the, by the IRS. Um, but you said there, there is some personal liability protection there. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know there, you know, for the solopreneurs that are listening, that's like, I'm just a sole proprietor. This doesn't really apply to me. You know, I just pay my own taxes and it's, I don't want to deal with all that. Talk to me about the benefits for a single member LLC. So in general, I'm not an attorney, of course, but um, a single member LLC, the advantage of it is liability protection and an anonymity, mm -hmm. right? So in branding, instead of being Joe Smith, you mm -hmm. could be, you know, metamorphosis consulting LLC. So from a tax perspective, a single member LLC in a, in a solo or a self, someone that's self-employed, sole proprietor, sole proprietor yeah. this absolutely the same from a federal tax perspective. But from a liability protection perspective, if someone wanted to sue you, they mm -hmm. you could you could be protected to some. Degree. It gives you some protection, and it also gives you an outward-facing brand and and 
in anonymity again you you, you might not want have everyone to have your name your your you know, think about W 1099s that are issued to you. Do you want everyone to have your social security number? Right. Um, so in LLCs are in general, you know, they're, they're cheap to form. Um, the only negative, I, I would say in the state of Tennessee as a single member LLC, you're probably going to pay up to $500 of franchise tax. That's not that much when you think right. about the, the asset protection. So, so that's yeah, good. That, that's, that's good. That's good. So info. That's, why, that's why I think that if you're getting started and you're going to be serious, if you're going to be a subcontractor for someone or drive an Uber, you don't need an LLC. Um, and I know I, I'd love to drive an Uber. I just think it'd be a lot of fun. But <laughs> you, um, so you, know the first, you know what the first question you ask when you when you get an Uber to your Uber driver? No. How long have you been driving Uber? <laughs> <laughs> hey, and they always say, you know what they always say? This is my second job. Yeah. My first job, I'm a an attorney right and Nashville, in Nashville's first job as a songwriter song yeah. there we go right yeah, yeah, or right. I moved here to be a songwriter <laughs> exactly I moved I'm, here you know we have about uh maybe 10 minutes left you know one of the things that I'd like to talk about and you mentioned it early on is I think it. you called it hacks I want to know uh, I don't know how if that's do you appropriate optimize to, your <laughs> there we go <laughs> optimization mm -hmm. talk about Safe. simple hacks that folks can take advantage of or do again this is not prepare advice for right that but you feel are are, are are ways that you see companies like us or service companies that could take advantage and um, maybe if they have this their own cpa they can start talking to them mm -hmm. if they haven't because i've had cpas before that literally just they just really wanted to do my tax returns that's it they didn't offer me hardly any help at all mm -hmm. unless i really asked i had to dig you know, and not only that, but I'll say that um, I've found it hard to find financial experts that understand not only the, the, the service business entrepreneur model, but this sort of technology facing model. I had a CPA um, about 10 years ago and uh, I had uh, in, in my business, we, you know, we did some of the similar things that, I, that we do today, but one of them was like, you know, building technology and websites and those kind of things. And I remember my CPA being like, what do you do? He's, he was like this old guy. And not, not that there's anything bad with that. He was like, kind of like sitting back in a gold chair kind of thing. He's like, oh, you know, oh, you do the, the oh, you do, you do internet, website, internet stuff. You'll never make any money, but as long as you like it, <laughs> I'm thinking like, I'm thinking like I get to switch because uh, he doesn't understand my situation be, at all. Before we get in the hacks, I do want to just uh, give one. So little, yes, that's important. Sorry. One little scenario that happened when I first started working with Chris. Um, uh, my my past CPA would not only do our corporation but do my personal taxes, and I I took it all to Chris. And he's like, can can you give me your last couple of years? I was like, sure. So I gave him my last couple of years, and literally this is the first meeting with him. A couple of meetings later, we met again. He's like, hey. Um, just so you know, uh, you didn't write off your, um, your home, um, um, office, no, 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 no your, your uh, mortgage in interest from last year wasn't, wasn't, wasn't on the, ta your, your CPA completely forgot it. He's like, you got $3,000 coming back to you for that. And he amended in my tax return. And literally within like a month, I had $3,000 back in my pocket. And I'm like, dude, you're paying for yourself. Like, this yeah. is awesome. And I never had anybody that I felt even cared that much mm. um, or even had the time to, you know. Um, and so for me, that was my first experience with Chris. And from there, it's been it's been awesome. I mean, well, just I know we want to get into what he said, but I'll just reinforce that. Like to anyone listening, you say you're bored, Chris. Um, I've heard it. <laughs> no, it's great. I've heard it called your bench. But as a, if you're a serious entrepreneur, you know, in any capacity, even if you work for a company, but you've got, you know, some complexity that you're managing, you have some ambition, you're doing that, you need specific, trusted specialists in these areas because otherwise you're gonna you're not gonna be able to get yeah. where you're going and you're gonna be distracted by it. You need that and they have to care about it. You know, the lawyer, the CPA, the banker, I've heard like the, you know, th these are your bench that you need your guys, you need your or your gals, like you need them. Yeah. I mean mm -hmm. too, I think as business owners, some business owners, the the number one thing that's hard to let go of is the is your money like it's hard to find somebody who's going to be like your cfo because you have to trust them you have to have a lot of trust mm. and um so i think you know with me um with working with chris it's definitely i completely like i trust him you know more than i trust myself so um 
and it's awesome. And so, so give us the start, optimization. Let's talk about some of the optimizations some a little bit. Well, thank you. I appreciate the kind words. Um, I would say right now, um, remember that you change your facts, you change your tax, you can manipulate what you put on your tax turn legally and ethically. We think about manipulation like a bad thing. So if you're, what are some of the things you should do? Well, the first thing you do is usually your, your planning for 2021 starts with your tax preparation of 2020 and looking at where you're at. Look at where you're at and, and number one, did you get the result you thought you were gonna get? Mm. If you don't know where you're at, can you imagine driving somewhere without MapQuest? I don't know. How, our <laughs> yes, parents had trip text, right? Mm -hmm. um, but so you're, you're just driving around hoping to find something. Mm. So that's the first step. Understanding that maybe taking the time, it could take five to 10 minutes with somebody that knows what they're doing, walk into your tax turn, understanding where things land. You know, we talked about entity structuring. Um, immediately, if you have, if you're self-employed and you're going to qualify, definitely apply for the PPP too in, in the near future. If you're self, you know, if someone that's or, or anyone that's going right. to qualify. If you're not going to qualify, take a look at the employee retention tax credit, which is now it looks like it's up to fourteen thousand dollars per employee for the first couple quarters. Mm. Um, don't be afraid to educate yourself. And as far as go, you know, go online and, and I subscribe to a couple of CPAs that I really like their YouTube channels because I'm like, I want to hear their message. I want to hear their take on that. So uh, educate yourself a little bit. And um, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. The first hack would be really looking at all your tax stuff for 2020 and understanding what these papers are and figuring out you know, just talking through where, where you're at right now. Cause that's mm. always a good Educate. starting spot. Is there any, is there, is there any thoughts on like, when you want, I'm talking about hacks and optimizations, like for, for, for cash in the business, mm -hmm. like what's the safest, best way to do that, mm -hmm. to, to protect it and to let it work for you as best as possible without it being really risky. Cause I know again, access to it is important. Um, I know we, we always, um, I, I personally preach like, getting to a goal of a year of operating expenses quickly accessible allows you to um, make decisions without worrying about going up and down, firing, hiring, and going out of business, that kind of thing. But whatever that is, you've got this, hopefully businesses have this kind of stable of, of some cash and resources, but what's the best way to protect it and do it? And in your opinion, again, this is not advice, like mm -hmm. talk to your attorney, lawyer, all those kind of things. But and, and I know you're not even an investment sort of specialist necessarily, but just from your position. Well, I would say I agree. If you can, if you can, I mean, accumulating a year worth of um, overhead costs would be amazing. I mean, six months is really good. So if you can get three months of overhead expenses saved up, that's all. that allows you the freedom to do some other things and think about what if you do have that savings. Let's say your average customer is five thousand dollars a year. Okay, just think about it. Well, okay, if I could save if I could save a hundred thousand dollars. You know, let's say seventy-five thousand dollars. I should be able to make five thousand dollars a year. So I basically just got a new customer without doing anything. Mm -hmm. So that's maybe something. In, in now, what do you invest in? Obviously, you're going to want to talk to the right people, but it doesn't have to be, um, you know, or reinvesting in your business. I will say, understanding the difference between cash flow, tax flow. Like, if you take, if you save a hundred thousand dollars and go pay off your mortgage, if you're lucky enough to have a hundred thousand dollar mortgage, that's great. But there's no tax deduction for that. Right. So making sure that you first set aside savings for potentially paying taxes, but also have a way to track where you think you're at tax wise on a quarterly basis, because that's the thing I think when when people start making more money than they're used to, you know, it's kind of funny, like having no money is a burden, but having a lot of money is a burden too. So if you have if you saved up fifty thousand dollars, what the anxiety is is okay, I know I'm gonna owe tax on this. How much? So first quantify where you're at. Give yourself that freedom to say, I've saved 50,000 in my business savings account. I'm gonna owe 15,000 in taxes, but guess what? That $35,000, I'm gonna let it work for me. In yeah. general, as an entrepreneur of 18 years, I think my best bet's on me. I'm always gonna reinvest in my business or the things for me, I like real estate, that, but but I can understand um, understand that. So that's, that's really interesting. I, I like that take because I think it's counterintuitive and not many people say that, but if, if you're, being successful, reinvesting in what you're good at is is actually one of the best strategies, right? 
for anyone listening, you know, um, in, in our business, I, I, I like things to be as simple and systemized and, um, as low anxiety or, you know, so that, so that I can, so that I can, uh, put all my focus in the right places. And so what we started doing, which just seems to help us is every month we do a P and L and, you know, if there's a, if there's a profit, we take 30% of that, put it in a tax account Mm -hmm. and just put it aside. And then we keep going. And at the end of the year, 30% is an overestimate, right? I would say, right? right? Exactly. Yes. Um, and so at the end of the year, you're not worried about, am I going to, and, and, and we, you know, you may, you may pay it quarterly, may do whatever you do, but like my point is like, you put it aside. Um, and then when it comes, when it comes to it, you've either got, you've got your taxes maybe covered, or you've got something that you can, you've got a little bit savings. Now you can invest in, you can do other things. So and I'll leave it like, yeah, just thinking like that, I, that is a great strategy. Kind of like the first thing we said is put, try to put 10% away into a savings account, mm. but think about how you feel when you're driving somewhere and running late versus when you're not running late, right? You're going to in, in the stress you feel about just driving and you're frustrated, you're running late. That's how people feel when they don't know where they're at with their taxes. They, yeah. they have this money and they're just, and it's distracting them. And it's distracting them from doing their their work. So how you're doing it is great. There's I don't think there's any one way for everybody, but that is that sounds just simple. Like a, I would say is yeah. great, you know. And like and I, I agree with you. I would the way I would uh, maybe articulate it is, you, you know that the stress of having something hanging over your head does not allow you to focus, even if it, it just it it splits your focus. Mm-hmm. And so the less you can have those kind of areas where you're like, I'm not sure if I'm doing the right thing over here. I, mean, I don't know if I'm going to hit get hit with something. That mental anguish is ha- is is hampering your ability every single day in uh, my opinion hey uh just uh, as a r- kind of a wrap here go ahead and rephrase your sayings because you had a few good sayings mm-hmm. i think that can stick with the uh, three listeners. the three to let- the big three all right remember the government is your business partner yes. involuntary but you can write the you get to write the rules and and bring on your own board of directors your facts equal your tax your facts are your tax you want to change your tax you got to change your facts and understand the difference between cash flow and tax flow. And not every cash flow out is a tax deduction. And mm-hmm. conversely, you can look at the R&D credit. That's a great example we call a, a plus P. I know I'm not, this is just, you could do it after the end of the year, post year end, and it doesn't cost you any extra money to get the R&D credit. It's typically a contingency on the credit that you get. Mm-hmm. So it's not that, so that's a, plus cash flow plus tax flow and no additional cash flow yeah that's that great good. that's great um well, awesome. well thanks for uh joining us yeah. today chris it's been how, uh, how can people good. find you if they want to ask questions or right so um i they can go to the uh they can go to real estate cpa dot guru and then there's just a page where you can put in your information i will i'll reach out within one business day and um we're happy to answer some questions and see if uh, someone's potentially a good fit um, or guide them in the right direction. Um, I did start a professional Facebook page and uh, that's facebook.com slash or backslash your real estate CPA. Terrible marketing guys are probably shaking your heads, but the good thing (laughs) is we're so uh, referral based that it's kind of, it's one of those things working on a YouTube channel. um, Done a lot of presentations that I'm trying to cut up and uh, it's really just a project for, work with my 12 year old on. So that's coming eventually. It's that's more great. for fun, but well, you thank s- you. Do you still have yeah. a web page up that shows like any information on different things, PPP and things that you keep up? Yeah. So we have some resources for clients. So if you, if you go to the real estate CPA dot guru or real estate CPA dot guru, um, I can send that to you. We have a COVID-19 resource center that we developed with a ton of links and also videos that we're updating regularly. We also have another uh, video library f- specifically for real estate investors. Awesome. That's awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much. And as always, uh, listeners, go follow us uh, on Instagram or LinkedIn and like and review this episode. We'd appreciate it. Chris, thank you so much. We've learned so much and I really appreciate you being here. My pleasure. It's been a blast. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All Chris. right. Till next Bye. time. Bye.